Hey everybody, it's Leanne. I hope you are having a great day. I'm here with part six of my series on criminal law, and today's lesson is going to be on parties and in inchoate offenses. So let's get started. All right, so let's talk about parties to crimes first. Okay, so what is a party? A party is someone who participates in a crime. So that's pretty simple, right? Um, you have two types of parties, two big general categories of parties. The first category is principal. That would be a person who is directly involved with the commission of a crime. And then you have somebody who's considered an accessory. That person helps commit a crime without actually being present. Now, at common law, and you guys know from the previous lessons that common law goes back hundreds of years, um, there were four parties to a crime under our common law, and that would be principles in the first degree, principles in the second degree, accessories before the fact, and accessories after the fact. So to better help explain this, these concepts, I'd like to present a situation to you. Now, let's pretend I have a prized goat. He is so prized that I actually keep him in my house, not in a barn or anything. He's right in the house with me. And I have developed this elaborate security system to protect my goat from anybody who might try to get my goat, okay? Now, unfortunately, you and my neighbor both have this deep interest in stealing my goat, okay? So... Just keep that scenario in mind, and we're going to use this um, scenario as we go through the lesson so that you can better understand, I hope, all of these different parties to crimes. Okay, so the first one that I mentioned under the common law was principal in the first degree. Now, this is the person who actually committed the crime. So let's say you. You decide that you are going to break through my elaborate security system. You are going to go inside of my house. You steal my goat. You take him outside of my house with the intent to permanently deprive me of my goat. Once you have done that, you have committed the crime. You are actually present for the entire thing. And therefore, you are what is called a principal in the first degree. Now, a principal in the second degree is someone who aids, counsels, assists, or encourages the principal in the first degree during the commission of the crime. And this person is sometimes referred to as an accomplice. Okay? So, in my example, remember I said that my neighbor also wanted to help you with this whole situation of stealing my goat? So, let's say my neighbor... He decided that he was going to tell you when I wasn't home, so he's communicating this information to you. Once you arrive at my house, he meets you outside my house, and he helps you break through my elaborate security system. Now, he doesn't actually go inside of the house and steal the goat. And once you get inside and you take the goat and you leave, actually, my neighbor has decided to go home. However... Because he was actually present during the crime and he actually participated in it, he helped you with it. He assisted you with it. Because of that, he is now a principal in the second degree. He is your accomplice. Now, to be a principal in the second degree, it is required that that person have a minimum of what is called constructive presence. If they are completely off-site, they are a different person person, they fall under a different classification. So an example of constructive presence is something that I just talked about. He, he's there and then he's gone, right? Um, the classic example of constructive presence is somebody who sits in a getaway car. So let's say um, my neighbor decided, you know, to drive you up to my driveway. He sits in the car, you get out, you break through the security system, you steal my goat, you return to the car with my goat. The whole time, the neighbor is sitting in the car. That is constructive presence. He didn't actually do anything except drive the car, but he was there, right? He assisted you. He aided you. That is considered constructive presence, and that makes him a principal in the second degree. Now, for punishment purposes, the law looks at both of those people, the guy driving the getaway car and the guy who actually stole the goat, you guys are equally guilty, and therefore you are punished equally under the law. 
Okay, so let's move on to accessories. What exactly are these people? Now, this is a person who helps commit a crime, and they're not actually present at the crime. We've got two types. We've got accessory before the fact, and we have an accessory after the fact. Now, an accessory before the fact is a person who, without being present, encourages orders or helps another person commit a crime. Now let's say my security system is very elaborate and you and my neighbor don't know anything about security systems. So you go seek the help of this guy. We'll just call him Jimin. So you guys go and you talk to Jimin and Jimin explains to you how to break through the security system because he is somebody who has worked on these security systems before. He knows exactly how to break through them. Okay. Now, he knows you guys are planning to disable my security system so that you can commit a crime so that you can steal my goat. Now, but all he does is give you the information that you need in order to do that. He doesn't come to the scene of the crime. He doesn't even know when it's going to occur, but he knew it was going to occur at some point in the future and he provided you with enough information so that you could actually complete the crime. In that case, he is considered an accessory before the fact. He helped with the planning. Does that make sense? I hope so. Now that's different than somebody who is an accessory after the fact. An accessory after the fact is a person who learns of a past crime and then helps to conceal the crime or the criminal. Now, in this instance, imagine that after you and my neighbor have stolen my goat, you guys are in the getaway car. You decide to drive to your friend Sally's house. Now, Sally she sees you guys pull up. You have a goat in the car. She's like, hmm, I think that's Leanne's goat. What are they doing with Leanne's goat? And you guys tell Sally that, oh, we just stole this goat from Leanne. And instead of saying, hey, you guys get out of here. I'm going to call the police. What does she do? She says, well, you guys better come inside of my house and hide because I know the police are going to be looking for you and they're going to be looking for that goat. Once Sally takes that step, she becomes an accessory after the fact she, because number one, she learned of the crime and number two, she helped conceal it by inviting you into her home. She hid not only you, the criminal, but she hid the evidence, which was the goat. Okay, so at common law, accessories could not be convicted until the principals were convicted. So at common law, years and years and years, hundreds of years ago, they had rules that said, look, Sally, who really didn't, you know, she showed up later. And also Jimin, remember, he came before because he just gave you information. At common law, they said, we can't arrest those people unless we are able to convict the people who actually stole the goat. Because, I mean, think about they're, they're related to the crime. But if the crime, the, the principals themselves aren't actually convicted of the crime, how are you convicting these other people that are just accessories before the fact and accessories after the fact? Um, it also procedural rules that they put into place just made it more difficult to prosecute accessories at all rather than to prosecute principles. However, what I just told you is no longer the law. You can see why they did that. However, now statutes commonly group principles and accessories before the fact together and then they punish them all equally because everybody that's involved in a crime should be held accountable and should be responsible for the crime. Now notice in that last sentence on the slide it says statutes commonly group principles that would be the principle in the first degree and the principle in the second degree and accessories before the fact. You notice they didn't include accessories after the fact. They are treated a little differently, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But in this case, we are specifically talking about accessories before the fact and principles. They are all grouped together in statutes, and they are punished equally. Okay, so what mental state do you need to have in order to be an accomplice? I mean, what kind of, like, you know evil mindset do you have to have in order to steal my goat? I mean, come on, what kind of evil purpose person are you? It's very sad. Well, before and during the commission of the crime, this is what your mental state 
should be, according to the common law, you should have a specific intent. You're specifically intending to commit that crime, the crime of stealing my goat. That's the mindset that you need to have in order to be an accomplice. Now, under the model penal code, it says that you have to do what you are doing, the acts that you are taking. You must do so with a mind that is knowing or purposeful toward committing a crime. Negligent and reckless acts are not enough to make a person an accessory or a principal in the second degree. So if you are just doing something basically almost by accident, you're just not even paying attention, or you're reckless, you don't even really care about the consequences of your actions, but you're not specifically and willfully or purposefully intending to do something, that's just not enough to make you an accessory or a principal in the second degree. All right, so let's zoom in on accessories after the fact. I said that they were treated a little differently. Okay, so a person is an accessory after the fact if they won aid, comfort, or shelter um, a criminal, okay? So if they, they do all of that in relation to a criminal, two, with the purpose of assisting the criminal in avoiding arrest or prosecution. It has to be after the crime is committed and the accessory must not be present during the commission of the crime. If you have all of those things, then you have an accessory after the fact. In my example of Sally, who let you come into her home after you committed the crime, she meets all of those elements and she is indeed an accessory after the fact. Her mental state, if she were to be prosecuted, the prosecution would have to prove, okay, that Sally was aware of your criminal status and so they would have to prove that somehow in my story you told her what happened, right? And two, they would have to prove that Sally intended to hinder any attempts for you all to be arrested or to be prosecuted. And again, she's concealing you and she's concealing the evidence. Now, interestingly, it is possible to be both an accessory before the fact and an accessory after the fact. So let's pretend, now we know Jimin is an accessory before the fact because he helped you with the planning. Remember, he gave you all the information you needed to break through the elaborate security system, right? Let's pretend instead of going to Sally's house after you committed the crime, you went to Jimin's house. And he did the same thing Sally did. He decided he was going to hide um, you and my goat and my neighbor all at his residence. Once he does that, he fits into that category of both an accessory before the fact and an accessory after the fact. See how this is all fitting together? How this, this system of parties works, right? Now, another interesting note is that accessories after the fact are generally punished less severely than principles and accessories before the fact. And I believe that's for the simple reason that obviously a principal who actually, a principal in the first degree who actually broke into my house, took my goat, and then exited my house with the intent to permanently deprive me of my goat. And my neighbor who drove the getaway car, okay, those are my principals in the first degree and principal in the second degree. Those two are the most culpable, aren't they? They're the most guilty. And also, Jimin, who helped plan. He didn't do anything to stop them from committing a crime. He knew that a crime was about to be committed, and he joyfully provided them with information so they could do it. So those people, yes, I find them very guilty. I find them uh, to be a problem. Now, the accessory after the fact, let's talk about Sally, okay? Okay. Now, she didn't know the crime was going to be committed. She didn't help plan the crime. She didn't participate in the crime. What she did was is she welcomed her friends into her home because she thought that she was helping them in some way. So she might be slightly less culpable. And because of that, she will probably be punished less severely. Now, in a, in a situation where 
they have actually murdered somebody and she helps dispose of the corpse, that's a completely different situation. And that accessory after the fact is somebody who's going to be held much more accountable and be punished more severely than somebody like Sally in my story who's helping to conceal a theft. Okay, so that completed the parties portion of the lesson. Now we're going to move on to something called inchoate crimes. What exactly is an inchoate crime? Well, it's very simple. It is a crime that just hasn't been completed. So the, the process of the crime has started. You've planned it. You're moving towards it. But something happens and you aren't able to complete the crime. Now, sometimes you're not able to complete the crime because something happens. You are um, interrupted somehow by somebody or something. Maybe you're on your way to go rob a bank and there's a tornado and you can't get there because the weather is so bad, okay? Um, or oftentimes you're trying to commit a crime, you're getting ready to do it, but the police are on to you and they have interrupted your crime. Now, these laws, the inchoate crime laws, the whole point of them is so that law enforcement can intervene before you finish your terrible crime. Imagine if law enforcement had to wait till you finished doing something horrible before they could arrest you, before they could do anything to stop you, and before they could hold you accountable for what you intended to do. So that's why these, these laws exist. They're there to give law enforcement that power to kind of step in and intervene without losing, um, without risking the loss of getting their criminal conviction for what you actually intended to do. Now, crimes that fall into this inchoate category are attempt, conspiracy, and solicitation, and we're going to go over each one. First, we're going to go over attempt. What is attempt? I'm sure you've heard of this. I'm sure you've heard, oh, well, he was guilty of attempted murder. What does that mean to you? Well, it means he tried to kill somebody, but he didn't quite do it. So it was only attempted murder because the murder wasn't completed. So attempt is an effort to commit a crime. It goes beyond just preparing to do it. It proceeds far enough that you can actually charge somebody with the crime. Um, and it's provable that they were actually going to complete whatever crime it was you charged them with. So if you charge them with attempted murder, it can't just be somebody who said, yeah, I was thinking about killing my neighbor. That's not enough. Just somebody thinking about it is not enough. We have to go a certain distance into the crime, if you want to think of it that way. So because there's this idea of, hey, can you really be charged with something you didn't complete yet, that you just intended to do? Very early common law did not even recognize attempt crimes. However, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, attempt crimes began to be recognized. And of course, today, I mean, that was a long time ago, right? The 1800s. Today, attempt is recognized in every U.S. state. And for good, for good reason, right? Because just because somebody didn't finish their crime doesn't mean they shouldn't be punished for it. Okay, so what do you have to do to attempt to commit a crime? First, the defendant must intend to commit a crime. You have to have that mental state, right? Two, the defendant must act. They have to take some act in furtherance of that intent, and the crime need, cannot be completed. If the crime was completed, you would just charge them with that crime, right? Why charge somebody with attempted murder if they've actually gone through with it and murdered somebody, you're going to charge them with murder. And by the way, there's this doctrine called merger, right? Um, you can't, if somebody has actually completed the murder, you cannot charge them with both attempted murder and murder because attempted murder gets swallowed up by the whole idea of murder. I hope that makes sense, right? It's just common sense. You can't charge, charge them with some, somebody with attempting to do something when it's actually been completed. So attempt, definitely you have to have that third element where the crime has not been completed. So I mentioned mental state. You have to intend to commit a crime. Well, what intent do you need? Well, under the common law, it had to be specific intent. 
okay? And the model penal code says you have to do something knowingly or purposely. And all of the modern statutes say um, that attempt is indeed a crime. Some of them specifically identify what crime must be in intended. So there might be an actual attempted murder statute, right? And others just refer to an intent to commit a felony. It's this all-encompassing, very broad statute that says anytime you attempt to commit a felony, whatever that felony is, um, you can be held accountable for that. Okay, so we talked about the mental state in attempt. Now let's talk about the actus reus. Now I mentioned before, just thinking about murdering somebody, that's not enough. Thoughts alone do not establish a crime of attempt attempt. Also, mere preparation without anything further is not enough. So if you're just sitting around and you're making notes to yourself about how you're going to steal my goat, but you don't take any action or steps beyond that, you're just thinking about it, writing some notes, maybe thinking about, oh, well, how would, you know, I get into her house, and you're just really kind of thinking about it, and you're, you're going so far, you're preparing by taking notes. Maybe you've taken a couple of pictures of my house, but not very many. That's just not enough to get somebody on attempt, right? So how do we know when somebody has crossed the line? How do we know when somebody has gone far enough that we can actually charge them with the crime of attempt? Well, there are four commonly used tests to determine if an act is close enough to completion in order to permit an attempt conviction. We're going to go over each one of them. Now, when anytime you hear that there's four tests, you know that the courts in the jurisdiction, the courts in the jurisdictions across this country are generally split on this. They all agree there should be some type of a test, but many of them use different tests. So, of course, you want to check your jurisdiction to see which um, uh, test that your jurisdiction follows. So, here's the four tests there's the proximity test the race ipsa loquitur test, the probable desistance, and then the model penal code's substantial steps test. So each one of these tests is used in different courts, and you can apply these tests, and sometimes you could have the exact same situation, and you apply one test, and you say, oh, well, that's definitely a, an attempt. And if you apply one of the other tests, you're like, nope, doesn't rise to the level of attempt. So you can get a different outcome depending on which test that you use. And some of them have a much lower bar than others. So the first one is the proximity test. And again, these are all based on your actions that you have taken. So the proximity test examines what acts have been taken, what have you done toward the commission of this crime, and which acts are left to be taken before you actually complete the crime. So they kind of see how far along on the path of completing this crime you are. Well, this is what they did to plan as far as stealing the goat, okay? This is how far they got, and they needed to take five more steps before they got uh, to completion of the crime, or they needed to take one more step. That's going to be up, you can see this is a judgment call, right? So the Supreme Court, Justice Holmes said, um, the test is there must be a dangerous proximity to success. That means you've got to be awfully close, right? Okay, so that's the proximity test. The next test is race ipso loquitur. Of course, Latin. We couldn't have a, a legal lesson without some Latin in it, right? So race ipsa loquitur is also called the unequivocally test. Now, what this does is it looks at the crimes individually. It finds some act along the timeline of that crime, a certain point in time, which indicates that, def that the defendant has, quote, no other purpose than the commission of that specific crime. So now the other one said you had to be in dangerous proximity, right? This one says you have to look at all of the actions that were taken and you have to come to the conclusion that there was no other purpose to those actions other than that this person was going to commit that specific crime. Okay, so that is that test, the race ipsa loquitur test. What about probable desistance? 
Now, probable desistance focuses on the likelihood that the defendant would have followed through with the crime had the opportunity existed. Now, this is a really sort of loose type of test. It's basically saying, yeah, he would have done that if he had the opportunity to do it. So it's not really looking at all of the actions that this person has taken like the other two tests. It's more of saying, yeah, we think that there's a, a strong likelihood that he would have actually continued along this path and he would have actually committed the crime. Now, I noted here in the second bullet point that critics have attacked this test as being arbitrary. So this is the one that probably gets the most resistance from, from critics and legal scholars in saying that this is a really difficult one to apply because how, you know, how do you know that the defendant would have followed through just if only he had had the opportunity? So I'm not saying that, that this test doesn't exist. It does exist. It's just it's a little bit looser than the other ones, and it's a little bit harder to define and quantify. And the last test on our list is has been suggested by the Model Penal Code. It is called the substantial step. And that's kind of a good explanation, right? You're taking substantial steps. So what this looks at is if substantial steps have been taken toward the commission of a crime, then one is guilty of attempt. So you just have to see what steps have you taken and were those substantial steps toward the commission of that crime? Now, the conduct, the acts that you take, must strongly corroborate the actor's criminal purpose. So those acts that are taken must corroborate the mental state, the mens rea, remember your criminal purpose, okay? So, and actually the Model Penal Code lists some examples so you can get an idea of what a substantial step might be. And they include such things as lying in wait, that's you hiding in the bushes, okay? Um, enticing or seeking to entice the victim, that's you sort of luring somebody, okay? Um, investigating the location of the planned crime, that's you sitting outside for uh, you know, two weeks, you know, casing the joint, as we call, right? Um, you're sitting down, you're like, oh, they arrive at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then they leave again at 3 p.m., and then you're taking lots of photos, and it's, it's a lot of surveillance, right? How about unlawfully entering a structure where the planned crime will happen? That's your, you're doing like a test run. I'm going to break in, I'm not going to steal anything, but I'm going to break in, and then yeah, you're unlawfully entering the structure. Possession of material necessary to complete the crime. You've got like duct tape and rope and all kinds of crazy nonsense, a murder weapon, those types of things. If you have all of that in addition to some other things, and if those strongly corroborate your criminal intent, you might be in trouble, okay? Possession, collection, or fabrication of materials to be in the crime. Fabrication means to make something, right? You're actually making something that's going to help you commit the crime. Or actually soliciting someone to commit the crime for you. That's whenever you ask somebody, hey, I'll give you $1,000 if you go steal Leanne's goat, okay? Um, that's basically asking somebody to do it for you. So under the Model Penal Code, those would all be considered substantial steps. Okay, so what about defenses to attempt? Now, of course, you can see a lot of people want to bring up, hey, I didn't actually commit the crime. I shouldn't be charged with this. So there are some defenses that you can come up with. One of them is abandonment, okay? If you voluntarily stop before you commit the crime, it's all on you. You've had a change of heart, okay? If you change your mind before you cross that line, and remember that line is going to be determined by those four different tests, and depending on what jurisdiction you're in, it's going to be one of the tests, but you get the idea, right? So before you cross that line, if you have a change of heart and you voluntarily um, abandon this whole idea that you've had, that is a defense and it's called abandonment. Now, an, an, it must be voluntary. It can't be, be because you got caught and that's why you stopped, okay? has to be completely voluntary. Another defense is legal impossibility. This is where a defendant actually believes that they're doing something illegal. So let's pretend you think that going to the movies is illegal and you go through all these preparations, like you get all dressed, you get in your car, you drive to the movie theater, you get to the parking lot, you're acting all sneaky because in your mind it's totally illegal to go to the movies. 
And then you walk up to the movie, but you stop because you're like, I can't go in there. That's breaking the law. And then you walk back to your car. You cannot be charged with attempted going to the movies because that's not a crime. So you can't prosecute somebody for a crime that doesn't exist. That is called a legal impossibility. You were not trying to do something illegal. Okay. Now, factual impossibility. Okay. This is when a person attempts to commit a crime, but it's impossible to do so because there's some sort of factual error. So my example is that you believed that you were selling illegal drugs, but instead you were selling fake drugs, like you were selling catnip. So you were intending to do something illegal, which was to sell illegal drugs. And let's pretend you're in a state where it's illegal to sell marijuana, right? So you think that you are selling marijuana. You think that you were doing something illegal and it actually is illegal. But the factual impossibility is that you're not actually selling marijuana. You're selling catnip. You don't know that because you're silly in some way. Um, you think that catnip and marijuana are the same thing. You can still get charged with that because factual impossibility is not a defense because you had an evil intent you believed that you were committing a crime that actually exists. It's just there was some fact about it that made it impossible. And therefore, that's not a defense. You can't say, oh, but it was catnip. No, you had the requisite mental state. You had the intent to commit an actual crime. Okay, so we're all done with attempt. So now we're going to move on to conspiracy. Conspiracy is an agreement between two or more persons to commit an unlawful act in an unlawful manner. Okay, so you just need two people or more and you need to come to an agreement. That's all it is. And I'm sure you hear conspiracy all the time and you often hear it like conspiracy to commit murder or conspiracy um, to distribute um, narcotics, something like that. Okay. Now, you have to have at least two people. Now, there is an exception uh, to conspiracy, and it is called Wharton's Rule. It's also called the Concert of Action Rule. Two people cannot be charged with conspiracy when the underlying offense itself requires two people. So I've put two examples here. Gambling. You cannot gamble by yourself. You need another individual to gamble with. Okay. So the crime of gambling requires two people. Because the crime itself requires two people, you two didn't enter into a conspiracy to gamble. You just gambled. It's the same with adultery. If two pe it takes two people to commit adultery. So because the underlying offense itself requires two people, you cannot charge people, um, two people with uh, conspiracy because it's just simply adultery. Now, um, so just remember conspiracy is reserved for those crimes where generally it only takes one individual to commit the crime. Stealing my goat only takes one person. Okay. When two or more people enter into an agreement to steal my goat, now there's a conspiracy to steal my goat. Okay. Now there is one limitation on Wharton's rule. Okay, if three people conspire to gamble, there can be a conspiracy charge because it only takes two people to gamble. You see that slight difference there? So there's only two people in the crime. You're just gambling. But if there's three and you're all agreeing to gamble, now we can actually have a conspiracy to gamble because gambling itself only requires two people. It only takes two people. Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay, so let's move on to the actus reus. What actions do you have to take um, in order to commit a conspiracy? Well, it's simply the agreement. When you enter into the agree agreement, the crime is complete. So in some jurisdiction, the agreement is enough, and in others, you must, ha you must have what is called an overt act, which would be an act taken in furtherance of the objective of the agreement. Okay, so... 
many jurisdictions and you have to check which one yours falls into. It's just the agreement itself and then the crime is complete. The conspiracy is complete. Um, and other states require the agreement plus some overt act. Now, even though an attempt, remember I said mere preparation was not enough to charge you with attempt, it is sufficient in many jurisdictions to charge conspiracy because all you need is the agreement, which would be part of the preparation. All right, so we understand what the act is. It's the agreement plus some overt act. What about your mental state? What mental state do you have to be in to be you know, in a conspiracy? Well, you have to have the intent to commit an unlawful act, or you have to have the intent to commit some sort of lawful act, but do it in an unlawful manner, okay? Now, conspirators must have the intent to enter into an agreement, plus they also have to have a specific intent to commit some unlawful objective. So you have to have both those things. They have to intend to enter into the agreement with the other people, and they have to possess a specific intent to commit an unlawful objective. Now, just an important side note, when, you, when it comes to conspiracies, there are some crimes that if you just do them by yourself, they might only lead to civil penalties. They might actually rise to the level of something criminal. However, if you do it in a group, it may rise to the level of a um, criminal charge and one example would be fraud. There are some types of fraud that just might result in civil penalties. And they're not, they don't rise to the level of being criminal. But if a group of you get together, then all of a sudden it becomes a crime. And you can enter into a, cons that can be a conspiracy. And it, uh, it is a more serious charge then. Okay. So now intent in conspiracy is very strictly construed. Okay, so because of that, um, both mistake of law and fact are defenses. Remember before we said mistake of fact was not a defense um, when we were talking about attempt, but in conspiracy it is because your intent is very important. So they're looking at everything very closely. So the parties must have had an evil purpose for their union. So if the parties believe that their actions and their purpose were legal, they would have a valid defense, okay? So if they thought they were doing something, if you and three other people all get together and you agree to do something, but you wholeheartedly believe that it is something legal to do, but it turns out it's actually against the law, that can actually be a defense because your intent is very important. You had to have an evil purpose. So that's what they're looking at. Now, if you withdraw from an ongoing conspiracy, it is not a defense. Remember, you could, in attempt, you could abandon, and that was a defense. It doesn't work that way in conspiracy because the crime was complete once the agreement was, was made. So as soon as you made the agreement, you're done. You've committed conspiracy, okay? Um, unless you're in one of those jurisdictions that requires an overt act. If you've done the agreement and you haven't yet committed the overt act, you could withdraw in that jurisdiction and you would be okay. But if you've already committed the overt act, you're done. You cannot quit after that. You've all, the crime has been completed at that point. Okay. And just note that the model penal code does recognize voluntary withdrawal as an affirmative defense. And, but it has to fall into that category where you're in between the agreement and the overt act. Okay. Some special procedural notes when it comes to conspiracy. Conspiracy itself is a crime all by itself. You don't need to have anything else with it. It is completely independent of what you were conspiring to do, that illegal thing that you were conspiring to do. Because of that, it is not a violation of the Fifth Amendment's double jeopardy prohibition, where you can't charge somebody twice for the same crime, right? Um, you can charge conspiracy. Um, you can charge conspiracy to commit murder and you could also charge murder, okay? Um, it is possible to have both, and it is possible to punish 
um, individuals um, for both of those things because conspiracy is a completely separate crime from murder because the crime is complete once the agreement is made. And if you're in a jurisdiction that requires an overt act, agreement plus overt act. Okay, now conspiracy is inchoate, um, meaning it is not completed because conspiracy can still be charged even if the underlying criminal objective was not met. You can be charged with conspiracy to commit murder and never actually commit the murder. Because of that, it falls into this category of an inchoate crime. Now, this one is really interesting procedurally. If only two people are charged and one is acquitted, which means found not guilty, then the other cannot be punished. Remember, it takes two to be in a conspiracy. So if one person is found not guilty, then the other person cannot be charged or it cannot be punished for conspiracy because one of the members of the conspiracy has been found not guilty. And if you have a group of people, let's say five people that are charged and the jury finds not guilty for all but two, those two people, the conviction, it still stands. All right, additional procedural notes. Co-conspirators can be tried together. Now, a lot of people think that this prejudices the defendant because one person may be more guilty in a sense than the other because they've done more in terms of the crime. And so when the jury looks at both these people sitting together, they think, oh, guilt by association. So this, there's this strong um, argument, a very good argument, actually, that it could prejudice the um, defendant. However, procedurally, it is perfectly permissible to try co-conspirators together. And then there's this special co-conspirator hearsay rule. Now, you guys know that hearsay are out-of-court statements. You know, one person said, if you don't have uh, that person in court to either verify what they said, um, you cannot introduce those statements. But in a co-conspirator situation, um, the evidence uh, of statements of one party that are, are made that are made out of court can be admitted in one party, meaning one of the co-conspirators. They can be admitted um, under this co-conspirator hearsay exception. OK, the rule is limited to statements made during the planning and the commission of the conspiracy. So they can anything they said during that time that can be introduced at trial by somebody who heard them say that and some statements that they may have made. Any statement made after the planning and the commission of the conspiracy are completed, that's all inadmissible still. Okay, so that completes conspiracy, and now we're just going to have one slide here on solicitation because there's not much to say about solicitation. It's simply the encouraging, requesting, or commanding of another person to commit a crime. That's where you try to hire somebody to do your crime for you, okay? Um, your mental state, you have to have specific intent. The defendant must intend to convince another to commit that offense. And the act is just the solicitation itself. It's, it's you saying, hey, I'm going to give you $10,000 if you go, you know, do this terrible thing for me. Okay. And it can be for any crime. It doesn't matter what it is. Now, a few states will limit it to felonies. But in a lot of states, you can also solicit somebody to commit a misdemeanor for you. And solicitation differs from attempt in that solicitation itself is a crime. And you don't need to do anything in furtherance of the crime. You simply just need to ask, hey, will you do this terrible thing for me if I give you $10,000? That's it. That's all you need to do. There doesn't need to be anything else. No substantial steps, no dangerous proximity, right? That's how it differ differs from attempt. And that you're simply, just simply asking the question. The solicitation itself is all that you need to have committed this crime. Okay, well, that is it for today's lesson. I hope that it was helpful. I hope that you learned some things. And if you enjoyed this, I hope you check out some of my other videos. And as always, I really appreciate it when you like and subscribe. And I guess that's all I have for today. So you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.